morning. Good morning. Uh, also, good morning to the people who are on Zoom. Would love to see your faces. I know you're smiling. So again, good morning. Welcome to First Baptist today, May 29th. Glad to have you all here. Today, remind ourselves that Reverend Hines is here with us bringing the message, so we're thankful for that. Please join me in the call to worship, and we know the routine that Dr. Print would be the response from you. Clap your hand, all you peoples, and shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord is awesome and the great King over all the earth. God has gone up with a shout. The Lord has ascended with the sound of trumpets. We will sing praises to God and sing praises to our King. Let us sing praises. God is the King of all the earth. Sing praises with your joyful voices. Yes, God is King over the nations. Our Lord Christ sits on his holy throne. Let us bow our heads, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning with sincere hearts and open minds. We realize that it is through you that we rose this morning with new opportunities to build on the foundation which you provide to each of us. We are reminded that we must put action to our beliefs. This past week has been full of horrors, but in the horrors we are reminded that you are still with us. Dear Lord, as we worship today, may we feel your spirit and leave with renewed hope. Amen. So if you are willing to stand, please stand and join in the singing of There Will Be Joy in the Morning. It's in 2284 in the Black Hymnal. So if you can and will, please stand. Today's uh, first scripture reading is from the New Testament. It's the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. In the first book, the office, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by convincing proof, appeared to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John the Baptist baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the time or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. When he had, when he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. 
while he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven. Suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come to the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Thank you all for that fine rendition of that song. <laughs> if you will join me in the Memorial Day lit litany, again, please read the bold prints. Let us give thanks to God for this land and with all its chartered liberties, for all the wonders of our country's story. We, we give, give you thanks, thanks O oh God, for leaders in nation and state, and for those who in days past and in these present times have labored for the Commonwealth. 
We give you thanks, O God. For those who in all times and places have been true and brave, and in the world's common ways have lived upright lives and ministered their fellow, to their fellows. We give you thanks, O God. For those who serve their country in its hour of need, and especially for those who gave even their lives in that service. We give you thanks, O God. O Almighty God and most merciful Father, as we remember these, your servants, remembering with gratitude their courage and strength, we hold before you those who mourn them. Look upon your bereaved servants with your mercy, as this day brings them memories of those they have lost a while, may it also bring your consolation and the assurance that their loved ones are alive now and forever in your living presence. Amen. Our next hymn is Eternal Father, Strong to Save, also known as the Navy Hymn. Now of all of the service tunes or hymns, and every branch of the American military has a respect for, respectful tune, the Navy hymn is the one that I believe is the closest to inculcating and gathering in the meaning of God's presence wherever people serve. If you can, please rise and join us in singing the Navy hymn. Our second scripture reading is two sections from the Gospel of John, chapter 17. And these are words recorded 
during the last hours following the Last Supper that Jesus had celebrated with his followers. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority, all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that we may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that the, those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be, be, may be in them, and I in them also. May God add his blessing to this reading and the hearing of his holy word. I want to offer great thanks to Pastor Dave for offering me the chance to come and be with you. I would have taken any chance to come and be with Harris anyways, but we are very glad to be here and to celebrate with you while Pastor Dave has a good time off. I also bring words of greeting from Reverend Mary Miller, who was Associate Executive Minister here for the region. Um, mid-90s until uh, she left this post to go to Massachusetts for the region there, and that was the region that, in which I served, so I got to know Reverend Mary very well. And I spoke with her this week, and again, I bring greetings to you from her and blessings on your continued good ministry here. We are looking today at that story that precedes Pentecost. Pentecost, that time when the Spirit comes upon people. And I believe Pastor Randall will also be talking about that next week, so I'm just going to dip into that because it's, it's part of this whole message. In the reading from Acts, which we find after the four Gospels, but scholars pretty much believe that Luke wrote it as a unified book. Luke Acts, flowing from Je the work of Jesus to the work of the apostles. And what Barbara read was that moment when Jesus, after his 40 plus, nearly 50 days of final teaching here on earth, as it were, polishing, honing his message for his followers and for us, and then was taken up into heaven. Now, some of you who may wish to read the Bible, and it's a good Baptist thing to read the Bible every now and then, might remember that there were a few others who also asc ascended 
bodily into heaven. Enoch, Elijah, and now we have Jesus. But, of course, the academicians want to fine-tune this a little bit and say, well, in Jesus, it's something special because Jesus ascended after resurrection. The others ascended without dying. Now, if we want more questions on that, I don't know about Pastor Randall. I don't have too many more beyond that. But I offer this. Remember that when you as well ascend to heaven, you will be with the Master in the master's class. Start writing down your questions and bring them with you. So Jesus ascends. I kind of think that would be a pretty dramatic event. And as I was driving across the country, I was reflecting on that, that the places where Jesus might have ascended were scattered around Jerusalem. Jerusalem of today is not the Jerusalem of that era. Jerusalem of that era, as well as today, is not New England. It looked quite a bit different. And it is not the Midwest. It is not Iowa. And yet, I had these images as I was driving of Jesus ascending and what that might have looked like. In New England... Maybe it would have been from one of the mighty crags, treeless mountains, Mount Kadadin in Maine, Mount uh, Washington in New Hampshire. We've been on that one. We, actually, we've been on both of those. And in my own community of Keene, just south of, uh, of it, is another one, Mount Monadnock, that again is one of those ones that trees don't grow on. Monadnock's quite a bit lower, and it's a very easy climb. But if Jesus was to be teaching and want to take his followers with him, maybe he did go to one of those rocky points around Jerusalem. But I offer you to think about maybe what it would look like if Jesus lifted off. Ooh, that just came right out of me. <laughs> Ascended into heaven from here in the heartland of America, where you can see four miles. And the edges of your vision might include silos reaching to the skies. Or I'm going to call them windmills as they spin generating electricity. And then amidst that, maybe Jesus rising up into one of those beautiful skies. Maybe all blue, maybe patchy clouds. It says he ascended into a cloud and was seen no more by them on earth. So take that away with you. And maybe you'll think about that sometime when you're driving. Drive carefully. Don't, don't look around simply to follow it. If you need to, stop. But just envision what it might have looked like if, G if Jesus had lifted off from the middle of Iowa. Jesus ascending is critical for what comes next at Pentecost. Jesus needs to return to his Father God. Jesus needs to be with him to bring the end, as it were, to the second stage, uh, I'm going to say second stage of his ministry. First stage, we have hardly anything about it. When Jesus is with God in the beginning, he was with God. Jesus, the word, was with God. Jesus comes down to earth, chapter 2. Jesus ascends, concluding that. Jesus reigning in heaven, which we all celebrate, or many of us celebrate, and um, the end of October, Christ the King Sunday, is that celebration of Jesus reigning forever until eternity ends, which is an anomaly because we say eternity means it ain't going to end. It's going to keep going. But we don't know. We truly don't know. So Jesus ascending 
brings an end to that second chapter. And we here on earth, we who remain on earth, we begin the third chapter of living into the story, living into the truth, sharing that story, living out that story as much as we can, as we are called by the Spirit. I believe in the Trinity very deeply. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. They all work together. And you will, we will celebrate that element next week where the Spirit takes center stage. But Jesus passing from the midst of his followers triggers that moment where we, his followers of today, need to continue to recognize Jesus' call upon us to be witnesses into the world, to be present in the world, to seek to make even a little difference in the world. And that little difference can be a big difference. We won't know. We won't know. If any of you have been a dabbler in gardener or even a professional farmer, you know you scatter the seed and you don't know what will come up. Jesus scattered his words amidst us and continues to watch the harvest as we work. I am second career pastor, at least second career. And I took a long time responding to the call of the Spirit and how we each receive God's call through the Spirit will be different. Heck, if we were all felt called to be ministers, there'd be nobody in the pews. Not such a, well, it might be a very different type of church. <laughs> but we need to have that presence of followers, not to denigrate the people who follow, but to note that as we gather each Sunday, whether it's in prayer, whether it's in teaching, whether it's in worship, we are being prepared each week to do work the next week. Our regular work, as well as we don't know what God's going to touch us with, where God's going to call us, where God's going to use us. So I didn't know either. In 1987, my pastor at the moment, invited me to join him in traveling to St. Louis. First time I've been there. Is anybody here from St. Louis? Raise your hand. Okay. While I was there, I did go up in the arch. I did walk around. I think I actually took a boat tour as well. But we were there flying in on Friday, uh, flying in on Monday from Boston and flying back on Friday afternoon. This was an ABC USA sponsored, designed, executed evangelism event, 1987. The leaders of the ABC church at the time wanted people to experience the concept that evangelism is not um, um, a dirty word. It is not. It is about knowing that God calls, listening for God's call through the Spirit, and responding to that call as you can, will, and might. So we were there that week, and the first speaker at the Monday evening meal was Father Michael Green, an Anglican priest raised in England, educated in England, and an author before he died uh, in 19, 2019 of over 50 books, working on the issue of, th th they weren't huge tomes, they were nice, encapsulated, th thin themes, so that you could get deep into the, his concept and questions about what it is to be 
a people of God, what it is to be a person called to be an evangelist. And he had just had a book published, and it was for sale, and I have a copy at home, The Empty Cross of Jesus. And Michael spoke that first night, <clears throat> introducing us in a broad fashion to the concept of evangelism, that God will use us, that God calls us, that God wants every one of us to be fishers. Now in the scripture, it's fishers of men, fishers of others, fishers of people. Let's not genderize it. Fishers to share what God has done with you. And a seed was planted that, that week. And it took a long time germinating. I can't remember the name of the plant, but there are plants that can take 40 or 50 years before they blossom. Mine was a little bit shorter. And I'm not sure if I'm blossoming. You might make that decision later. But Jesus, the Spirit, touched me that week. In 95, I considered going to seminary, and uh, events didn't transpire that way, so I went off and got another degree instead. In 2000, after getting that degree, within a year, I got that itch again. Something wasn't still right. And my beloved wife, Anne, said, go to school. Go to seminary. I just completed a four year, a master's degree in four years at Northeastern University where I worked. After hours, a master's in that area is a lot less. It's about third the length of a master's of divinity. So I said to myself, am I going to continue to work? Am I going to go to school part time? And said, stop work, go to school. So I did and everything fell into place, and I served, and I retired, and now in retirement I can stand before you as a guest preacher. But I offer this as a brief example of God's calling. We don't know what it's going to be like. We don't know how it's going to manifest in your lives. We don't know. Maybe you even don't know, but it's already manifesting itself. We don't get telegrams from God. We don't get tweets. We don't get postcards. Does anybody here still send postcards? I know Anne does. Yeah. There are so many ways for the Spirit to communicate to us, but it is up to us to stay open to how and to when that is occurring. Now, I think what's equally critical is to have friends or family, colleagues that you can trust so that you can sit down and converse when you sense this movement of the Spirit, the touch of the Spirit, bringing you, prompting you to do something more, to do something different, to make a change. Now, most cases, the prompting of the Spirit is not to make you become a superhero. You don't get to join the Fantastic Four. Remember, it was a Fantastic Three. You're not going to become the fourth person in the Trinity. No, you're not going to become a Marvel Avenger. But you will become, in some way, a fisher for God. And I think, and I've shared this image for many people, that a prime way to frame that call is what Jim calls low-key evangelism. Oftentimes when we might hear the word evangelism, we might think somebody's standing on a soapbox in the corner, decrying all sorts of words and verbiage that you're not going to follow. But really, I think, Low-key evangelism is being conscious of your environment, watching people, knowing what's going on, even, well, it's not as if you're going to know what's going on completely because you're not doing a Vulcan mind meld, but being aware so that you know, 
something's not quite right. Somebody looks a little out of sorts. We say a little blue. Well, if they look a lot blue, get them to the hospital. But you know what I'm saying. Something is out of sync, out of tune in their lives. Be aware. And now if you have built a relationship with that person, you might be able to share a little bit. Even if it's just sitting with them and letting them know that whatever is bothering you, I can't solve, but I'm here. I'm here. For me, that's low-key evangelism. And you're building a deepening relationship, and at some point in that relationship, and in many other relationships you might have, you will get to that point where they might say to you, thank you. How did you know I needed your presence? And maybe what they were experiencing as they shared it was something that resonated with you and you could say, I journey down that road. I journey down into that valley. And God helped me to come back out. And thereby share a little bit about your life, low-key evangelism. It isn't about converting people. It isn't about discipling people. It's about being a witness of God's presence in your life, of the faith you are carrying. God calls us all to be witnesses. The Spirit calls us, each and every one, every day. We need to be hearing, and I can't give you special ears, I can't give you special sensors, but when you do sense that, maybe you will check that with another friend, or maybe that new friend, when you sense that God is leading you to do something, to say something, even just to be present with somebody. That makes a big difference, knowing that we are not alone in the world. And because Jesus came and lived and died for us and ascended, he has left us not alone, not bereft. The Trinity is with us in some manner. The Spirit is with us. I believe that Jesus still moves among us. How? I don't know. But I do believe. And so I invite you to believe also that God is here. God is among us. The Spirit calls. And we are called to answer. God be with you as you go forth this day. Amen. Will you join me in a prayer? Long ago, O oh God, your son remained with his disciples after his resurrection, teaching them to love all people as neighbors. As disciples of Jesus in this age, hear our prayers on behalf of the universe in which we are privileged to live and our neighbors with whom we share this space and time. We are reminded and humbled, O oh God, that Jesus came to live among your children here on earth. We remember how Jesus lived and experienced a life imbued with work, sharing, suffering, love, conflict, reflection, joy, sorrow, and so much more. We see that Jesus personally knew exclusion and inclusion. Now, Guiding Spirit, remind us that Jesus knew life very similar to what we experience daily, maybe. We are also reminded that Jesus lived and died for each of us. Nothing we have experienced is fully unique. The Trinity, God, Jesus, and the Spirit go before us, preparing the life to come and preparing us for living now on earth. 
on this day that remembers the ascension of Jesus and foretells the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, we give thanks to you, God, for sending Jesus to live with us. In humble thanks for your assistance to neighbors and strangers, we note that this week our society honors and remembers people who have served and died in times of conflict. This is a time when many will visit cemeteries, decorating them as reminders of those who live now with you, God. During this week, when we pause for a moment of peace and memories, maybe even shed a tear, remind us that Jesus was the Prince of Peace and shed tears for lives lost and found. The call of the Spirit is a call to trust you, O oh God, to embrace the truths of Jesus, a call to respond and mold our lives to Jesus. Yet today, Lord, we live, all people live, in times of unrest, uncertainty, fear, hatred, sorrow, and loss. Be persistent, God. Remind us again that these feelings were known to Jesus and that by trusting to and walking with Jesus, the spirit of wisdom will reveal how we also can live to bring peace to broken lives. Forgive us, God, when we forget or ignore the teachings of Jesus, his call to share, to care, to be a neighbor to all people. Strengthen us, Lord God, that we may live more fully into holy calls to serve, to love, to share, and even just to pause and sit with those in trouble. Teach us, wise spirit, that we need not have all answers. In fact, we cannot know everything. Yet by our seeking peace, our living peacefully can be a model to others, a beacon of hope and light in a world obscured by darkness and hate. Receive all these prayers, O God, and tra transform us through your spirit and the power of our words, thoughts, and hopes. Truly, Lord, may we always have eyes to see and hearts to understand not only what you do on our behalf, but what you call us to do so that your holy realm will come to glorious fruition here on earth. Amen. For our concluding hymn, we will use a piece. What is the tune? It's a Welsh one. That's right, so it's a Welsh one. And you know it. Uh, Eternal, thank you. That's what I couldn't remember. Lean on, O King Eternal. But the words are by Reverend Carolyn Gillette, a United Methodist minister, and she has offered this ministry. We find it on the internet all over the place, and it's good work that she does. So rise if you are able. In your book, in the bulletin, you have verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. And again, you know the tune.
now as you leave, I offer these words from Paul in his letter to the Ephesians. I pray that our Lord, God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know the hope to which Christ has called you, and that you may know the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for we who believe. Go in the Spirit of God. Amen. Thank you.